Quest. We're going to continue going beyond public speaking, but you can see I'm back in the office again. Uh, I'm taking these ones uh, from from the office, and I'm, I'm recording them here. Uh, and because I'm going back to a more office-focused, work-focused work uh, type of discussion, and I'm going into communicating in groups. We spent most of this uh, most of this video, video series we talk about public speaking and that's good, that's important, uh, but we also want to talk about a little bit about relationship in the last three videos and now we're going to talk just a little bit about working in groups. Working in groups is a big part of life. Uh, very seldom are we able to work entirely alone and not report to anyone and not talk to anyone and it's just all about us. Most of the things that we do we do as part of groups, but working in groups is complicated and it's hard. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about just a few things, four things really, that typically can go wrong in our groups uh, when we're communicating in groups, and really three methods of looking at groups in order to make sure that things are either going right or to make them go right if you have to. Like I said, there's really four things that go wrong in groups. Uh, four typical problems in group communication. The first is scheduling. No matter how important the group is, and even if it's part of somebody's job, even if it's something where they have to be there, they have to work on it, it always seems that life gets in the way. I'm sure you know in your own life that life gets in a way, the way. So as you multiply the numbers of people in your group, you multiply the number of lives that get in the way. It becomes very difficult to work in groups. It becomes very, very hard. Um, and so you've got to kind of find a way to make that work. Sometimes you have a problem called social loafing. Another way that we sometimes talk about groups, uh, sometimes call this, is we call it negative synergy. Social loafing is when because people are all working together in the group, everybody kind of figures that somebody else is going to do it. I remember one time I went fishing with my, my dad and my brother and me. And, uh, we dad dug the worms, we put them in a can, and they were sitting out there on the table, and we all went out to the fishing spot. And we'd all thought somebody else was going to get the worms. It had never been discussed. Uh, and this is a problem that happens in groups. Sometimes people will even say in groups that nothing gets done because everybody thinks somebody else is going to do it. Sometimes you have a, a problem called free riding. Free riding is where you find out that everybody uh, is working on something. And so you just kind of take a step back. You don't really do the work, and you let everybody else kind of do it for you. Then you are a free rider. And free riders make the other people in the group mad, because this person just isn't pulling their weight. They're not doing their share of the work. And so because they get mad, and they're upset, and they're angry, and everything like that, <sighs> you, you, get it, you can get people angry. But it also seems like the people in charge don't seem to notice that the free rider is just free riding. I've been in plenty of groups with work situations where it seems like the guy who did nothing is the one who gets the promotion based on the work that we all did. It aggravates me to no end. But the worst thing that can happen in groups is something called groupthink. You've all experienced groupthink. You might wish you hadn't, but you have. Those situations where you make a decision as part of a group that you would never have made as an individual. I'm pretty sure that the only reason that some items like beer bongs exist is because groupthink also exists. And so people are sitting there and thinking, you know what, having a beer is nice, but let's see how many beers I can put into my stomach at once. This is stupid. Okay, that's foolish. And nobody, unless you're pretty far advanced into your alcoholism, is going to be sitting at home thinking, you know what, by themselves, I'm going to put all of these beers in. No, it's something you do as a group, and it's stupid. Uh, 
those of you who are guys watching, and maybe some of the women, but probably almost all of the guys, at some point, you knew how suspension on cars worked enough to know that cars can't really jump Dukes of Hazard style. And you never would have attempted it. But there you were with a group of friends and vroom, 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 you're going to make that car jump. And you made, uh, or maybe one of your friends made, a very expensive decision. Here's how you can tell when your group thinks going on. Sometimes there develops an illusion of invulnerability. Around my apartment complex, every now and then, I know that groupthink is happening nearby when you see the flashing lights of the police and somebody shouts out, they can't catch us all. A belief sometimes in the group's own morality that because you're doing this as part of the group, it's going to be okay. Sometimes shared stereotypes develop that you start to think in other, of other groups in negative ways. There are collective rationalizations. You all encourage each other. Why, why is this okay? Well, it's okay because the group says that it's okay. Self-censorship. Sometimes an illusion of unanimity. A unanimity, unanimity, see, even I have trouble saying it. A unanimity means that it seems to be unanimous. It just seems like everybody agrees. But the truth is, if anybody did disagree, there would be pressure on the centers. Oh, come on! You know, on the, the, those who would go against the descenders. Uh, come on, you can do it. And even mind guards start to go up in your own mind where you wouldn't even begin to question what the group is doing. These four problems, free riding, social loafing, and uh, scheduling and groupthink, these are the problems in working with groups. But we've also discovered that it really does, that, that we do accomplish a lot more in groups. I, I talked before about synergy, and I talked about negative synergy, but real synergy also takes place in groups. Most of you know that four you can't lift a piano, but it's not that hard for five. That fifth person isn't lifting so much more. It's just the combined strength of you all lifting makes it easier. So you want to be in a group where you can actually get that synergy. That's what you want. And so, how can you do that? How can you make sure it happens? Well, there's three ways of looking at it. Uh, three kind of models that talk about how successful groups work. The first two models that I'm going to share with you are what we call descriptive models. These descriptive models look at work groups that are functioning well, and they look at these groups that are functioning well, and they say, okay, because this is functioning well, you know, you, you can go along. And these descriptive models are nice, because you might be thinking, is my group working well? Are we getting that positive synergy or not? You can look at these descriptive models, and since these describe a group that's working well, if you're doing all these things, you're probably going just fine. The third is a prescriptive model. You might look at your group and say, you know what, we are not functioning well, but we still need to get our job done. What is it that we can do to make this work? Okay. The first descriptive model is Tuckman's five-stage model. Now, when Tuckman wrote this theory, this, this idea of how groups work by studying groups and seeing how successful groups function, he attempted to make it rhyme and fell a little bit short. I just want you to know, the attempt at rhyming is not my fault. He put in uh, five stages, forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. See, performing, it starts to break down, and adjourning, the rhyme really breaks down. Forming, the group members try to get together and figure out how their task is, what their task is and how they're related to each other, how, what's going on. That first stage when you get together is like, I don't know what we're supposed to be doing here. That's a good stage for a successful group. In the storming stage, the members try to ascertain status and position, who's in charge, who's doing what, what's, what's happening here. 
then you go into the norming. And the norming stage, you start to figure out exactly uh, what kinds of interactions you have in the group. Then you perform the task. You perform the task, you get it done, and then you adjourn. You basically tie up loose ends and say that it's over. If your group seems to be going in that direction, you probably have a pretty successful group. Aubrey Fisher also developed an idea of how groups work together. He said that there are four stages uh, of a group coming up with a good decision. And so this is one of the ways you can tell if, these, if you're going through these stages, you might be coming up with a good decision. You begin with the orientation. After the orientation, you have conflict, then emergence, then reinforcement. Orientation, basically, you come together and you have that awkwardness of people working together. That first always starts out. Then you have a conflict. See, this is where a lot of people get worried. Now, if you're having conflicts later on in your group when you're almost finished, you do have a problem. And I may have a solution. Uh, but if you have a conflict early on, this is good. Because out of the conflict, you get the emergence. The emergence is where you start to realize from your arguing, from your discussion, what actually is the best thing that can take place. Once you've done that, you reinforce that decision and you come to agreement. But sometimes you're in a group and it's not working well. And you need to make that group work well. Well, a guy named John Dewey developed what he called his standard agenda which is how a group can make itself work together. And it has uh, problem identification, problem analysis, criteria selection, criteria generation, solution evaluation selection, and solution implementation. So the first thing you need to do is decide what your problem is. So you're sitting there and your group just doesn't seem to be working out and you say, okay, we need to figure out what we're doing here. Pull out your notebook. You sit down. What are we doing here? You try and figure that out. Then you analyze the problem. And the word analyze really means take apart. You want analyze something by taking it apart. So you take apart the problem. What are the parts and pieces to the problem? Okay, now that you've got the problem figured out and know what you're doing together, you can start to generate criteria for a solution. What that means is, you figure out, okay, how will we know when we've got these, this problem solved? Well, when this has been accomplished and that's been accomplished, we know we'll have the, the problem solved. Criteria selection is very important, and it's a stage people tend to skip. They jump right from an analyzing the problem to trying to solve the problem, but they don't really have a means of knowing when the problem is solved. After the criteria selection, you start to generate solutions. How will, we know how we'll know when the problem's solved, so how can we get to that point? And at that point, you should generate lots of solutions, and they don't all have to make perfect sense. From those solutions which have been generated, you choose one. And most of the time, you try and choose one that is the most cost-effective and the least time-consuming. You try and choose uh, something that will meet all the criteria, solve the problem, without taking up too much time or money. Then you do it. Solution implementation is the last stage of Dewey's standard agenda. So, working in groups is difficult. We have scheduling problems, problems with social loafing, problems with uh, free writing, and problems with group think. But, there are ways that we can look at our group and can tell if it's working well or working poorly together. We can look at Tuckman's five-stage model, Aubrey Fisher's four-phase model, or if those don't seem to be working, if that doesn't seem to be the direction we're heading, we can implement Dewey's standard agenda. Hopefully this gives you some ideas about how you can work better in groups that you are a part of.